How did ancient humans first invent mathematics? What kinds of challenges would prompt people to invent mathematics in the first place? What kinds of reasoning steps are needed to invent mathematics in a primitive society where no one even knows how to count yet? The answer to these questions are coming up here on Inductica. <laughs> To understand what kinds of observations and reasoning steps people would have to go through in order to first invent math, we're going to have to first understand what it would be like to have no math. Now to tell this story, I'm going to present to you a fiction. Now the reason for this is, is we don't actually have any records of any society when they were inventing math. But if I tell you this story, and if I tell you a story which only uses ideas that were established earlier in the story, then it gives us a plausible fiction as to the actual observations and reasoning steps required to discover quantity and to invent mathematics in the first place. So to start this story, let's think of the primitive tribe of Babel. These are supposed to be the ancient Babylonian people. They live in huts, they hunt animals, and they cut up their meat with stone knives. They can't count, and they don't have numbers yet. Now, they can understand and treat things in groups, so they can say, a group of men approach from the north. But they don't know how many men are in the group. And the reason for this is that man's mind has a certain physiological limit. Man's mind can understand, simply at a glance, the difference between three and four items. It can understand the difference between four and five items. It can understand the difference, you know, just simply by visually comparing them between five items and six items, but this is where it starts to get hard. Now, it's not hard for you because you're cheating, you're using math, you're counting them or you're grouping them in groups of three or something. You're using mathematical ideas we haven't proven yet in this story. So you can't just say, oh, they count them. Well, because, well, how did they come up with the whole idea of counting? We have, that's, that's actually our next video. So they can't differentiate groups of things once they get to the level of, say, 10 things versus 11 things. They, they just have no chance. These two piles of things pretty much just look identical when you're not able to count. Now, in the case of some kind of trade, let's say, you know, a chicken and this many spears, you might be able to see that that's a good deal. And you might be able to see that this, this trade isn't so much of a good deal. Because remember, you can differentiate two things from three things. But for trades like this, you'd pretty much have to use your gut. You'd have to use your intuition on whether it's a good deal. And if someone took away two apples or put back two apples, you wouldn't really know the difference. So this unit limit, this, a this, this limitation on the amount of items in a group that we can differentiate is one of the fundamental things we have to overcome in order to start to understand quantity. And this is the initial motivation for mathematics. And this truly does make our world look a lot different. This significantly cripples man when dealing with the natural world. The ancient Babel would have known that the winter would come, but they wouldn't know how many days until it would come. They would know that they need to save for the winter, but they wouldn't know how much to save. So probably many of them would die, starve to death, freeze to death during the winter, especially the children. Math isn't just this game that people play for fun. It's not just a game that academics play. It's a matter of life and death. It has often been observed that man's body is feeble and that it is only his brain that is the source of his true power. But now that we've seen this issue of the unit limit, we can see something really shocking our brains are feeble too. Our brains, using sheer brute force, can't even understand the difference between 10 and 11 things. So it's only by inventing certain methods, certain systematic, disciplined ways of guiding our minds that we're able to handle more units than this. I mean, in the modern day, you know that we can handle millions, billions, or I mean, we can handle as many units as there are combinations of atoms in the universe. So there's basically no limit to the number of units that we can handle. How did we get there? Well, let's keep going through this process to find out. So how do they overcome this life and death issue? This brings us to our first story. Motivation. Imagine the Babylonian chieftain Marduk. 
He sits on the top of a hill, surveying an enemy army that is poised to attack his army the next morning. On one side of the hill, he sees the enemy army. On the other side of the hill, he sees his own army. And he's making a dire choice. His choice is to attack or to evacuate his people. If he attacks, he could win the battle and stop the threat. But if he attacks and loses, then his people will be enslaved forever. On the other hand, if he evacuates, then he'll get away with the lives of his people. Then they'll have to start over. They'll have to find new farmlands. They'll have to find new animals to hunt. They'll probably lose some people just from the sheer economic cost of this retreat. So Marduk wants to know which side is more likely to win. And obviously, it's the side with more men. And so this leads Marduk to a question. Marduk asks himself, how can I find out for sure which side has more men? Marduk notices that the enemy camp is larger, so maybe it has more men. But he can see that his camp, in his camp, his men are more tightly packed. So he can't really tell which side has more men just by looking at the camps. He can't use intuition. And he thinks about this, he's got to figure out a way, and he comes up with a way. What he does is, is he thinks about each of the men in his camp running over and meeting up and fighting with each of the men in the enemy camp. And so he keeps track of this, he imagines moving each of these men, pairing them off against one another. But after a while, he, he loses track. It's too many things to keep track of. Some of those men are moving, it's too hard. So instead what he does, he thinks of another idea. He takes a bag off of his hip and starts putting one rock into this bag for each enemy soldier in the camp that he sees. And he takes this bag back to his people and he lines his soldiers up and he has them stand in line and he puts a rock into each of their hands. And by the time he runs out of rocks, he finds out that many of his men did not get a rock. Marduk now knows that his side has more men and that it is worth the risk of attacking. Meanwhile, unbeknownst to any of the battle, a Mosul scout has snuck into their camp and he surveys the enemy camp. He watches the men, he observes closely and he reports back to his warlord and he tells them, sire, our enemy is weak. Their men are smaller than ours. Their chieftain plays with rocks instead of getting ready for war tomorrow. We should attack. The enemy chieftain also consults his oracle, who tells him that because of the shape of the moon, the gods are likely to favor them in the battle ahead. The Mosul could not objectively evaluate the enemy. Marduk, using the power of quantitative comparison, could. As a result, Marduk ordered his men to strike early in the next morning, knowing that they had the advantage. And because they were able to strike with such confidence, knowing that they had more men, the day was quickly won by Marduk and his Babylonian army. And because of the confidence that they had, knowing that they had more men, they were able to storm into the enemy camp boldly and overcome the Mosul. The Mosul retreated and were never heard from again. The day was won by Marduk and his power of quantitative comparison. Conclusion. When comparing the quantity of a group A to that of another group B, one can find out which group has the greater quantity by placing the units of each group in one-to-one -one correspondence. When this is done, the group with unpaired units has the greater quantity. If neither group has unpaired units, then the groups have the same quantity. So this is our first mathematical method the method of quantitative comparison, it is even more primitive than counting. But it was still enough for Chief Marduk to win the day for his people and to figure out, in general, which group has a greater quantity by putting those groups in one-to-one -one correspondence with one another. Now, I must emphasize, this is not the actual history of math nor the actual history of Babylon. It is just a story that could have been the way that mathematics first started. So if you'd like to see the next chapter in this epic mathematical story, hit subscribe or watch the next video in this series to find out how the Babylonians use Marduk's method of quantitative comparison to invent number words and counting. This video is part of a longer series dedicated to reproving the essential ideas of math and physics by showing an actual process of observation and reasoning steps scientists could have taken to prove these conclusions. 
Observational proofs, also known as inductive proofs, give us a deeper, reality-based understanding of these abstract ideas and demonstrate the proper method of scientific proof. This series starts with cavemen counting rocks and will continue all the way to the frontiers of quantum and relativistic phenomena. This epic story will proceed in a possible order of discovery, since science always progresses by reasoning about observations using what has been discovered earlier. To discover the long-term goal and the true power of this project, visit my channel page for more information. To see the playlist for this series or to see my channel, just click on the links on the screen. Finally, if you'd like more lectures like this, just go to patreon.com slash inductica. For just $5 a month, you gain access to the written rigorous forms of these proofs, as well as my 34-hour lecture series, An Inductive Summary of Physics. I'll see you in the next video as this inductive journey continues.